Thank you, Aaron, and thank you to the Wilson Center. Uh, Certainly, the timing and some of the substance of this law belong to the politics of the moment, but I'm not a politician, a political analyst, or a pollster. I'm a historian, so what I'll try to do is provide some broader context. The law is called Basic Law, the Nation State of the Jewish People. This reminds us of something often forgotten. Israel was established as a nation state. Now, not all states are nation states. In the New World, the U.S., Canada, and Australia, it shared values that form the core of the state. These countries were populated by immigrants from many nations. In the Old World, there are nation states, as exemplified by Western Europe. There, the core of the state is the solidarity of an ethno-linguistic group sometimes supplemented by shared religion. Where two such groups of comparable size have lived in one polity, there have been binational states. There's nothing that renders any of these three kinds of state incompatible with democracy. Now, of these three, Israel belongs to the category of the nation state, a part of the Jewish people, acting in solidarity, organized and sacrificed to create it. And they did so with international legitimacy, The UN Partition Plan of 1947 provided explicitly for a Jewish state and an Arab state. Minorities in both states would enjoy full civil rights, some collective rights, but not national rights. So it's not like the US, and it's not a binational state either. It's a classic nation state. The Jewish state arose with international sanction not to privilege the Jews, but to protect them. The purpose of the state from its inception was to be a safe haven for the Jewish people. That, because Jews as minorities elsewhere, proved to be uniquely vulnerable. In their own state, as a majority, they could develop their national culture without fear of persecution. So I belabor the obvious here, because people forget history. But I repeat, Israel by conception and design is a nation state and of the Jewish people. And the answers to all of Israel's constitutional questions have to be posed in this framework. Now, of course, some people reject the framework. They think there's no Jewish people, just Jews, religious believers. Or they think that Jews have no legitimate claim to sovereignty in this particular land. Or they don't believe nation states should exist at all. These people oppose the new law not because of this or that article, but because they oppose the idea of Israel. Now, it's true that this law doesn't enshrine individual rights, but for the principled opponents, such an addition wouldn't make a difference. By example, the Declaration of Independence affirms that the state will, and I quote, ensure a complete equality of rights and full and equal citizenship. Now, 10 years ago, members of Knesset were challenged to reaffirm the Declaration of Independence by signing it. Fully a quarter of the members refused. They included all of the Arab parliamentarians, but also the Jewish religious parties. Why? They both reject the idea that the Jewish people should have the unique right to national self-determination within the Jewish state. That right, they believe, either should be shared with the people of Palestine or with the God of Israel. What about the center of Israeli politics? It's been said that this law is divisive, and it is, because the politics of the moment are divisive. But remember, even Israel's declaration of independence was divisive. On the day that the state was declared, May 14, 1948, the declaration had to be approved by the People's Council, a kind of proto-parliament. On the first ballot, a full third of the members abstained, and that's without any Arab members. The declaration only passed unanimously on the second ballot because David Ben-Gurion reminded everyone that the British mandate would end at midnight and the armies of five Arab states would invade the next day. And so, one in every three persons who signed Israel's Declaration of Independence that afternoon had major reservations about some aspect of it. Which is to say, there's no way a law defining the Jewish state could not be divisive, unless Israel faced an imminent hostile invasion, and I think even then there would be a heated debate. So I conclude. One can argue over the necessity and wisdom of this law at this time. But as far as I can tell, the law changes nothing. Every article in it fortifies the status quo as established 70 years ago. It affirms Jewish collective rights, 
complementing affirmations of individual rights in other basic laws. It has two very different oppositions. Either those who want to change the structural status quo, that is, the nation-state, or those who want to change the political status quo, that is, and Netanyahu's run as prime minister. Israel, as a democracy, will offer both oppositions the chance to persuade the public in the next elections sometime between now and November 2019. Thanks, I'm finished.